Perfect. Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde. So my name is Evelyn Bougie. Uh, I'm an, a researcher at Statistics Canada. I've been at StatScan since 2006, so I've been there for soon 16 years. Um, and so I've been doing research for a long time and I also uh, I have a PhD in social psychology. I graduated in 2005 from McGill University. I'm originally from Montreal, so done lots of research and I'm hoping to be able to pass some of the wisdom, I guess, I think that I have gained over time. So um, I will share my screen and I'm gonna yes. jump right in. <laughs> All right, so, so welcome to this session on how to create stories that matter. So the objective of this session is to give you some tips and guidance on how to tell your data stories. Five minutes or so, I'll be talking to you about that. But first, before we dive into sharing your findings or telling your data story, I want to take the time to go back one step and give an overview of all the steps involved in the analytic process. Then we're going to dig deeper into that last stage, you know, sharing your finding, what's a data story, the components of a data story, planning your data story. And uh, then I'll pass the baton to my <laughs> colleague, who, uh, Jeremy, who's here. Uh, and then I can stop and uh, take your questions or your comments or anything. All right. So let's take a step back and look at the uh, process that you've been going through since day one, since you've been involved in, in your you know, individual projects. Um, so this is part of a course that I'm giving that is called Analysis 101, and we typically uh, break down the analytic process into six steps. Uh, the first two steps are, you know, making your plan. So identifying your topic, your context, and your analytical question. Steps three and four is the actual preparation and performing of the stats analysis. And steps five and six is sharing your finding. And that's probably where you're at right now. But, you know, I'm just going to take a few minutes here to go through uh, the earlier steps because it's important and we're going to get back to those earlier steps uh, in the presentation. Oh, step one, and that's something that you've done. That's something that everybody uh, who knows the scientific approach do. Uh, we, you know, when we uh, when we have a topic in mind or when we're asked to do something specific, we always start by understanding the context or investigating what we already know about a topic, right? So uh, it's important to understand that broader context before uh, you start digging into the data. You know, uh, take, make sure you fully understand the broader topic, such as the context surrounding uh, your topic uh, or the, you know, previous research. So we do a literature search. Um, so what are the knowledge gaps and what, are the, and what are the information needs? So this is a crucial first step to just identify what we already know in order to not do something that's been or that's already been done. We want to add something novel. We want to add something uh, that has value added to the field or to, you know, uh, current knowledge on the topic. So this is a really, really important step. So um, and then when we've done that literature review, right, when we've under when we understand the broader context around the topic, we're now ready to write down or identify or settle on an analytical question, right? Doing analysis or doing research is not a big fishing expedition. You don't throw your line into a database and hope to catch something interesting, right? It's purposeful, it's intentional. So the next step, the second step is to define your analytical question. And if you've done your homework correctly in step one, you will make sure that your question is relevant. You will make sure that it has value added because it's going to add to previous knowledge. It's going to fill an information gap. It's going to inform uh, stakeholders that have a particular interest in your topic. Uh, very important to really, really nail down your analytical question or questions. You may have more than one, that's fine. Um, but you know, a main question and then maybe some sub questions. These first two steps, you know, identifying your topic, the context, the relevance, value added in your question is really, really important. It's going to set the, it's going to set the stage for a strong analysis or at least a clear plan, right? And it's my understanding that you've all gone through this process because uh, you are 
um, already uh, three and four, uh, you're in it. It's preparing and analyzing your data. I am not going to dig deeper into this because this is not the purpose uh, of this session. Um, you know, let's go into the end of that process, which is um, in summarizing and interpreting your results. So you are ready, you know, now you've probably done a lot of analysis that thus far, you probably have a lot of tables and at some point you have to stop and ponder, okay, what 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 have I got? Uh, where am I going? What story am I able to tell with my data? And that's the step you're in, or that's the step that I'm assuming you're in. So um, presenting your findings clearly to others is one of the most challenging aspects of the analytical process. And that's why, um, especially when you spend months and months and months analyzing data, if you've clearly defined your plan at first with research questions, it's easier to get back on track and okay, staying true to your research questions, staying true with the goals of your projects, that's going to help you tell a clear story. You want to structure your narrative so that you're guiding your reader and interpreting the results for them. And so this is the stage you're in. Um, so this is the stage you're in. Um, and this is where we're going to dig deeper into how to tell the story of your data or how to tell the, the, the story of your process. Remember that data is not the story. Data is the evidence to support your story. Remember that it's very important. Um, and just to finish my six step process before we go into store the, the storytelling part uh, of this workshop, um, uh, you, you are also getting ready to disseminate your work, right? And how to communicate your, your findings successfully. And we're going to talk about that as well in uh, this session. So I wanted to take a step back and go through the whole process because we're sort of starting at the with the end, right? Telling your story, but it's you know I'm assuming that you you uh, you I just wanted to clarify that the setting of the research question and the context is also super important in the process of storytelling. So if you will, we will, uh, yeah, that was just a slide to show you that. Dissemination of your work is important. You know, you go from an Excel table to maybe extracting a few key messages, but then you need that last step of action. You want to inform your stakeholders. You will, you want to fill a data gap. So in an ideal world, your work will be useful to somehow, to someone, somewhere, someone, somewhere. <laughs> All right, so, now that we've looked at the whole process, it's it's time to focus on that last step of sharing your findings. So it is really the step where you're going to turn the statistical information that you've produced into some sort of story, into some sort of narrative that will be easily understood and retained by a specific audience. So this is where we start start to talk about storytelling or telling the story uh, of your data. So we're going to go through three uh, components here. Um, first, we're going to just talk about what is a data story and why do we need a data story? Why can't we just, you know, give big tables to people and assume that they're going to understand what, you know, our conclusions are? We're going to talk about the components of a data story and also some you know, tips and tricks on how to get going and how to plan your data story. Why tell a data story? You know, why, you know, I have a bunch of uh, tables. Why isn't that enough? <laughs> but we all know it's not enough, but why tell a data story? Stories are powerful tools because, well, people respond better to stories than to data. Uh, stories can captivate and stories can engage. They make data more relatable, especially if uh, your audience is not, um, uh, you know, people who are really, uh, uh, you know, statistically savvy or used to dealing with data. Stories make your data more relatable. They lend structures to your data and they lead to better understanding and retention. I think I have an example here which I hope will illustrate the uh, point that I'm trying to make here. 
So imagine you're a researcher in uh, in health, uh, counting uh, the number of deaths since a COVID uh, started, and you've come up with this nice table, and you're like, oh yeah, okay, this is this is the estimated number and percentages of expected excess and total death death by age group since the start of COVID. It will probably take most people at least 10 minutes to just digest this table. Oh, what am I looking at? Okay, I have expected death, excess death, total death, COVID-19 death by age group by different time periods. This is data, this is not a story. Your job is to extract the key messages and, um, and make it clear, make it relatable. So. As an analyst, I decided that the key story here or the key message really was going, really happened with this age group and uh, the 65 to uh, and older. And, you know, one simple key message or the main message of that table could be during the first 15 months of the pandemic, seniors represented 64% of excess death and 93% of excess death attributed to COVID-19. Oh, there already it's a bit clearer and it takes less digestion of the table to understand what is going on. What if I add something visual? Here I have just put in a pie chart, super simple, those uh, data that I um, highlighted with my blue rectangle. And there you go, we can see super clearly that uh, seniors um, or people over the age of 65 are really those who are the most at risk of death due to COVID-19 in the first year or so, uh, year and a half of the pandemic. So this is what you're, this is what we're trying to do to digest, to pre-digest the information that we have uh, created to communicate something to an audience. Okay, so what's a data story? Um, so a data story is a narrative built around a set of data, built around a set of tables, and it's accompany, accompanying, accompanying visualizations to help convey the meaning of the data. A data story has three components, data, a narrative, and visualizations. Visualizations are really, really important um, to uh, include in any data story that you are going to tell because it helps people interpret and retain uh, your story. Remember that pie chart where it was really, really clear and, 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 and visual that um, it was older people who were more at risk of dying from COVID-19. That's important information, right? So a data story reduces one's findings down to a core set that gets the point across in the most direct and succinct manner. So we're going to go through those three components of a data story, data, narrative, and visualizations. Data. So the Data part in your data story is statistics and information that you created, but it's the information that you choose to include in your data story. You are likely going to produce a lot of data tables or you're going to do a lot of analysis throughout your analytical journey. Your task here is to carefully select the findings that are essential to telling your story, right? Go back to your research questions that you've um, identified at the start or at the beginning of your process. How do I best answer um, my research question? Maybe you've gone down a rabbit hole. It happens. Uh, sometimes you spend days doing something and then you get out of it and you're like, whoa, okay, I, I diverged from my plan and to go back on track. So. You know, when you start, when you're at the stage where you want to package your uh, your story or package what you've produced, um, try to identify your key findings and try to identify your key findings as you go as well. So, you know, when you're analyzing your data, if something is interesting, but the data quality is meh, you know, because your confidence intervals are wide or uh, or whatever, or because it's based on a small sample size, it's probably not the most, you know, a, a robust finding that you want to base your story on. So select your key findings as you go. 
based on quality, uh, you know, based on uh, all those uh, standards that you apply in your analysis. And your key findings or your key messages will allow you to focus your story around the most important points you want to deliver. You probably will not report everything that you've done in your analytical journey at this point. You have to be your own editor. Your job is to document everything, but you also have to be your own thorough editor for your own work. So your key messages will help you structure your story so you do not include unnecessary information. Unnecessary information for your audience, right? We're gonna get back to that. And your key findings will contribute to answer the research question you set out to investigate. Okay, so here I just want to emphasize the point that everything that you've done is important, right? If you've done some sensitivity analysis to investigate if your finding was robust or if you've done some preliminary, I don't know, factor analysis to investigate the psychometric property of your scale, that's important and you're going to document that, but that's maybe not what you want to include in your data story if that kind of detail is not what your audience will be looking for. OK, key messages, key findings. That's the data part of the data story. The narrative, the second component of a narrative. Well, the narrative explains your data. Um, so what's the narrative? It's the data that you choose to report. Again, you, 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 you are your own thorough editor at this point. It's the order in which you report your findings. We're going to talk about narrative flow in a few slides, so keep that in mind. And it's the supporting information, including the context to the data. Um, a story does not happen in a vacuum. Uh, there's always a context to uh, your study or to your project, and that's what you've uh, established in steps one and two of your process, of your analytic journey, right? Context is really important in your narrative. Um, if I tell you it went from five to nine percent, well, this it part is meaningless without the context, right? What am I talking about? Am I talking about the unemployment rate? Uh, context is everything. So the narrative is the data you choose to uh, report, the order in which you choose to report your findings and the context. So in its simplest terms, a data story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. I'm going to let you digest that information. I know, I know we're thinking out of the box. No, but you know, it's true, it's true. And But when you translate that into your research process or into your data storytelling, we can uh, we can say that there's three components of a, da of a data story in your narrative. It's the what, it's the so what, and it's the now what. So if you don't know where to start, if you, if you have the blank page syndrome and you don't know where to start when you're writing about all the things that you've analyzed, go back to this simple what, so what, and now what structure. That's going to get you started to start telling the story of your data. So what's the what? <laughs> Remember steps one and two uh, of the analytic process. The what is your topic? What's my topic? What's the context, the broader context surrounding my topic? What is the research question or questions that I chose to investigate? And what's the relevance? What's the value added of this uh, of this analysis or of this study? We want to add to a body of literature. We want to fill a uh, data gap. We want to inform uh, some important stakeholders. So that is the what aspect of the narrative or of your data story. The so what? Well, that's your data. OK, so what are your findings? What are your key findings? Not what are all of your findings? Because as I said earlier, uh, at this point in the process, you're going to start to extract just the key findings or just the important key messages uh, that drives uh, the story that you want to tell. And how are you answering your question? That's the so what aspect of the data story. That's the conclusions and the next steps in research. So these are typically and most of the time suggestions for future analysis. 
and it's my policy uh, challenge. So for you, then now what would be what kind of policy recommendations could you make based on uh, your empirical evidence? Right. So that's the, that's the simplest form that your data story can take um, or that your narrative can take. Let's not forget the third aspect of a data story, which is the visualizations. Super important. The visualizations, it's all the tables and the graphs and the charts and the maps and whatnot um, that you use to support your data story. Uh, they're important because the, a good data visualization will aid the reader's interpretation of your data story. Um, a good data visualization will be or must be clear and decluttered. It must be quickly interpretable and makes your key findings pop. Um, what I do when I extract my or when I identify what are my main messages or my key messages, I always try to do one or two really good charts that, you know, show visually what I'm trying to convey here with my main message. So revisit your analytical questions and select visuals that clearly help to answer these questions. Oh, you can have tables and charts. Tables are usually uh, used to show more than a few data points. Typically in any report, you're going to have lots of tables in an appendix or throughout. Um, it, they, it's in, tables are crucial and important because they reduce the amount of data that you have to discuss in the text. Uh, you can refer to the table uh, and not, you know, repeat every data point because you know that the reader has the um, has the, the, the table for his or her uh, consultation. Uh, so, you know, tables are used to uh, display values in differing units. Tables are used to display detailed information, and that's pretty much obvious, right? Um, but a data table is never a good standalone visualization. Always try to extract one or two charts or graphs from uh, your data tables. Charts, they are used to provide an effective visual overview of the patterns in the data. So whenever you are investigating or seeing that you have something like looks like trends over time, question. Yeah. So um, here I have just a few examples of uh, different visualizations uh, that you can use. Uh, so a scatter plot when you show relationships between values, a line graph to show trends over time. I mean, this is quite basic, but what I want you to notice is that those uh, visuals are really decluttered and they're not too complex. A, a chart that is too complex and that requires too much eye movement and scratching or pulling of the hair to understand is not a good visualization. OK, that is the point of that. But it's always part of your data story. Always try to have a good visualization that illustrates your key messages. Who doesn't love a maps? A map? Maps are great uh, when uh, you investigate things that, and you can put uh, the different parts of the country in a map. So this is another type of data visualization that is uh, that you can use. All right. So data, narrative, visualization, how do you get going? How do you get going when uh, you are now ready to uh, sort of like write down your data story? So there's three, the, the, the third part, I think I'm good, good, good for time, is to plan your data story and it has three steps. <laughs> so first, who's your audience? Super important to identify your audience from the get go. And what's the goal and what's the context of your data story? And third, what format will best achieve this goal? Are you writing a research paper, an infographic, an article uh, for the media, et cetera, et cetera? Or maybe you are producing many products for the same analysis. It's good to know right at the beginning. The first step is probably the most important one. Identify your audience. How your work is disseminated will depend on your intended audience. How you write your work will depend on your intended audience. Who's your audience? What do they already know? What do they need to know? What do they want to know? A decision maker uh, will want to know uh, 
much less details about your methodology, but much more about your now what <laughs> aspect of your analysis should probably pay attention to 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 that aspect if your intense audience is uh, analysts and policy makers people in the in academia will be interested in your methodology because you know this is this is what we do in academia we uh, want to you know see how you got the results that you got and what methodology what data did you use so your audience is really crucial uh, right from the get-go and you as i said previously you may have more than one product for the same analysis to target different audiences at statscan it's really common um uh common practice to write sort of like three different things when you have one study the first one will be like a research paper then we write a daily i don't know if you are uh, familiar with the daily that we produce at statscan i'm going to talk about it later because i think it's a great tool uh, and infographics are more and more used now because people relate to those visuals and to those simple uh, popping key messages so yeah, so this is uh, a little bit like I, what I just said. If you're targeting other scientists and analysts or your colleagues, you're going to probably go for a detailed research report. If your audience is a media or the general public, you're probably going to go with an infographic, a daily. I'm going to go back to it or later. Fact sheets. Fact sheets are also great products when you want to simplify for the general public. Policy decision makers will maybe prefer a briefing note or a dashboard. Oh, so there's different types of audience. So be mindful that if your um, audience is the general public, there will be more on the novice side than on the you know expert and executive side. And this is going to influence how you write and what you report. So characterize your audience. What do they want to know? What's their background? What's their data literacy level? Um, and don't assume that everybody has the same data literacy level that you do as an analyst. Um, it's OK to uh, try to be really plain language when you talk about data. It's uh, it's a, a good practice. You want to make sure that everybody understands what you're reporting. How and why is your study important to them and what do you want them to know? And all of that will um it will, will influence how you write your paper or how you talk about your uh or how you talk about your research it's going to influence your use of jargon the style the amount of data the level of details like i said the method the method part is uh sometimes something that most people will not be interested in they're going to be interested in what's your one or two take home messages in plain language and uh all the background work that you've done or all those stats analysis that you've done are important. It's documented somewhere, but it's probably not what the general public want to know. So that's a good example of what you leave out of a report if you target the general public or an audience which will be more interested in the now what. OK, yeah, so this is what you found now what, right? So but it depends on your public. So that's why it's super important to identify uh, who's your intended audience from the start. All right. The second step is to identify your goal and your context. As I said, at StatScan, we never uh, make recommendation. Our goal is always to inform and new information is always exciting. This is, you know, how we keep motivated. <laughs> but you as policy analyst, um, your, your goal may be to persuade or recommend. So um, this uh, could be an important part of your data story. And so you're going to have that emphasis in the now what section. Context is everything. Um, it adds meaning to your data. Always add context to your narrative. Example of context could be current knowledge on the topic. Uh, you know, uh, you do, you, you've done a lit review, a literature review, you've identified data gap and you are adding to this body of knowledge. Well, that's important. The context is the current knowledge on the topic. Um, it could be the general economic or societal environment or you do, you're doing comparison. Are you comparing groups? Are you comparing geographies? Are you comparing things over time? So these are all examples of context. The key here is to uh, always situate your, uh, your tables or your data or your findings in their broader context. And that's something that you will have thought about in steps one and two of the process. Uh, 
So it should be clear from the start. Third step, identify your format. So data stories can appear in various formats. Uh, so are you writing a detailed research report, a briefing note, a fact sheet, and so on and so on? Why do we talk about audience and format? Now I'm going to talk about the flow. Your audience and your chosen format will drive your choice of narrative flow. So for example, a research report usually follows a chronological flow, and this is what I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Uh, whereas a journalistic style report requires your use of an inverted pyramid flow, and that is the style that we use in the daily at StatScan, and I'm going to talk about it in a few slides. Chronological flow, it's what most of us are most uh, used to. You write a report, you have an introduction where you set the context, the purpose, and the value added of your, of your report. Then you talk about your data and your methodology, you describe your data, you explain what you've done. In your results, you describe your results with a gradual review, right? You usually start by writing about all the descriptive things that you've done and maybe even just describing your sample. And then as the re result section progresses, then you can talk about the more complex analysis that you may have done. And then you wrap up with a discussion of, uh, you know, limitations and next step. That, that's really um, what most of us are used to doing. Um, fact sheets will typically use the chronological flow, but you're going to have less context and less discussion. The presentations of the result will be less wordy and there's a lot of visuals and the methods could be removed or explained in the text box. So that's another way of packaging your story for the general public. Um, inverted pyramid flow. So this is really uh, something that is uh, used in, uh, it's a journalistic style of writing about uh, your results or it's a journalistic style of writing your data story. You start with the lead. The lead, it captures your data's key message clearly and simply. So your first sentence could be, a new study uh, conducted uh, in March of 2020 showed that Canadians um, were uh, more likely to, and then go on and you explain what the findings, what the findings are. Your first sentence is your key message. It draws the reader's attention, and then you set the story in its context in the first paragraph. Then as you progress in your inverted pyramid flow, you can add supporting data, secondary results or other results, and all um, additional detail is at the end and could be like methodological notes and so on and so forth. So the benefits of an inverted pyramid flow is that it grabs the audience attention. And we know that most people will not spend a lot of time reading uh, reports. And so skimmers or those who have one minute to read what your data story will still get the important information because it's in this first paragraph. It's really effective. Talk about the daily. So uh, we and 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 you know the daily is what we produce every day at StatScan. We uh, we have a daily, and it's our our a way of um, disseminating all the research that we do. And the most important for the most important for information is in that first paragraph, right? There's no introduction. There's no conclusion. You keep you start with your key findings right up front, and then the remaining information is in descending order of importance or relevance to the storyline. So that's the idea of the inverted pyramid flow. Uh, if your audience uh, is the general public or decision makers who you know will not have time to read like a detailed methodological report. So what makes a good data story? And that's my last slide. <laughs> so um, it has a clear goal or purpose. It is format to tailored and its format is tailored to an audience. It uses context to frame the story, the context give, gives meaning to the numbers, and it's focused on your key messages. You hide your data story, highlight the main points. It has a clear structure. It uses well-designed and appropriate data visualizations to highlight your key messages. And if you do your and if you and if you do all of these things well, well, your data story will be remembered 
will be credible, accurate, and will be simple. So, um, I think that's it. I just want to highlight your attention. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to um, a series of videos that we have on our website. It's free, uh, it's self-study suggestions. I put the link there, it's our data literacy training initiative. We have a video on telling the data story and on data visualization. I uh, encourage you to uh, go um, look at these videos to further your learning. Um, my next section was then as you progress in your inverted pyramid flow, you can add supporting data, secondary results or other results, and all um, additional detail is at the end and end with our exercise. Great. Thanks, Evelyn. That was excellent. And uh, the extra special guest is um, the person I report to is Keith Godin, um, has joined as well. So I'll start just by saying I'm Jeremy Higgs. I'm the Executive Director of the Education Analytics Office of the Ministry of Education. Um, and Keith has joined as well because uh, he's Assistant Deputy Minister of the Governance and Analytics Division. Uh, Keith, do you want to throw in um, uh, anything? Because he's actually going to start off the presentation for us. Um, there's a couple of slides for which he will provide some excellent context. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Jeremy, and good morning, afternoon uh, to to everyone. Great, uh, kind of great to, to be here. And uh, Evelyn, thanks for the presentation. I think I learned a couple things just in the last 10, 10 15 minutes. So that's uh, that's great. Well, uh, well done. And we're happy to give uh, our spiel in, uh, in compliment. Um, and I will. So I'll, I'll comment just while we're waiting for the uh, the deck to to come on the screen to uh, to the group here. Uh, I have to say, I absolutely love this forum. Uh, you know, just personal anecdote on on my part. Uh, someone who's made a career of surfing this bridge between analytics and and public policy, and it's something I remember from grad school. They don't, uh, at least in my in my my background, uh, didn't teach you, uh, and so you really had to learn it through osmosis in in government. Uh, and there's a real tradecraft to being able to bridge these worlds of, uh, of of analytics. There's a language. There's an almost an ethos to the work. Um, and politicians and senior kind of public servants have a different cognitive frame, have a different language, have a different nomenclature. And and if you can you know kind of cross that uh, across that bridge, it can be really really powerful to provide uh, a lot of influence on on public policy. So. Uh, just having a look at uh, the materials from Statistics Canada, I would say, you know, the content from Jeremy and I is meant to be fully complementary, and that agrees certainly with uh, all of that content. A lot of, you know, really good advice there. Um, I would say our piece is complementary in that, um, you know, adding just some advice tips on storytelling. Uh, so the, the structural pieces, you know, from Statistics Canada, again, really, really good. Uh, and I think our pieces are, um, again, a compliment to that. So, you know, I think it starts and you'll, you'll see a lot of reference just in our context coming from the Ministry of Education, a lot of references about students and the education system, but you could replace these words with virtually any other under sector. They're meant to be transferable to other, uh, you know, other types of research. Um, but first, uh, the reason we highlighted this slide, and we pulled this from uh, a deck that we frequently use with the sector, is we focus on uh, you know, getting our compass straight. There's no bunch of statistical jargon and technological jargon. Our job, even on our analytics office, is how do we help kids? That's our job. That's the compass is set right. All of the noise and the methods and all that kind of stuff, you know, don't lose sight of our, of our core purpose. Um, and then we get into, well, what are the essential ingredients here? And the reason we highlight this, not only for our own data systems, but for systems in school districts, is pretty much all the time, there's a couple of these key pieces that are missing <laughs> that uh, kind of speak to why certain evidence can't be used uh, or kind of utilized in making it in making a decision. So uh, certainly leave, leave this slide with you, but just very, very quickly, um, 
you know, kind of starts with, uh, you know, these these principles for what we have in place, quality data, kind of shit in, shit out. Mm -hmm. So if there, if you don't have, uh, you know, high quality data, which I know this group is is very uh, kind of kind of well aware of, but we just see it time and time again. Survey data, for example, that the scales are biased, uh, you know, from a scale of zero to five, how how crappy is it? From a scale of zero to 10, how great is it? Well, no, there's, so people just in survey design and other kind of things just, you know, there's, as this group knows, a real science to that and, you know, got to get the foundation set set right. Another thing we see is we're kind of measuring the wrong thing. Like for kids, what do we value? Do we value literacy, numeracy? Do we value their well-being? Do we value stress levels? Do we value, fill in the blank, but people don't often kind of measure like, well, we've always measured things this way, or we've always had this indicator, that indicator. That's what the OECD tells us to measure, whatever it is. In your localized context, measure what you value, and that's where you're gonna have real impact. Uh, relative inference, I know more of a kind of a, a statistical thing, but um, we will, in the, particularly in the students context, we see all the time, this helps kids, this helps kids, this helps kids. Yeah, I get that. What helps kids the most? And kind of focus on that just in terms of public policy application that minister, uh, we know that you've heard, you know, fill in the blank lobbying group or advocacy that, you know, these, these groups are coming in with their program. Did it work? how much of an impact did it have and how much of an impact did it have in relation to other opportunities we have for you know kind of scarce limited limited resources uh pr prediction uh you know this is where and this is a tricky space uh for economists and and public policy professionals of uh you know we we do get into some some tricky territory of if you have this characteristic this characteristic and this characteristic um I would say there's almost a, a triumph of analytical capability and that prediction is very, very accurate. However, it's a really sad situation uh, and very unfortunate for kids, for example, that it is in fact that predictable. But navigating through that, what we have learned to Jeremy and I is, is evolving our story over time. We're actually trying to disrupt predictability. And so it's just that turn of phrase that those using those words bridges from what people are concerned about that, oh, geez, economists are, um, you know, um, almost ensuring a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, no, uh, we're actually measuring things and trying to disrupt that pattern. Technology, this is the dashboarding using AI and uh, man, I wish we had another hour. We could talk about uh, mm -hmm. talk about that kind of stuff, but, you know, utilizing some of those things which, which we're starting to. Partnership. In other words, go at this go at the speed of trust. No surprises. Uh, you know, keep people along alongside with you in the in the process. Uh, and then, of course, another whole other conversation would be on evidence culture. But this is appreciation and values within your own organization. That it's not just oh the data person that's coming in. And it's like oh we're interesting chart. No, that's embedded in in the overall kind of policy process. So. Um, so I know that was quick, but we see this time and time again. Not all of these ingredients are are in place, and uh, that's kind of more the the ideal state from our perspective. Uh, next next slide. Oh yeah, this one's super fun. So uh, <laughs> telling a data story to government pitfalls to to avoid. Now multiple presenters in different types of forums across social sciences will present similar type of constructs. Um, to, to groups like uh, to groups like this, um, and so some of these words can be interchanged with with similar type of of representations. But the point is, you will all face this in in your careers, academic setting, public policy setting, government setting, and and so forth. Um, and that uh, I don't know if any, any any of you are fans of of Steven Pinker, but he just released a book called Rationality. And you know he does a, actually a deep dive into the neuroscience and um, uh, of bias, and uh, as human beings, like actually why we do that. And uh, on, on one hand, there's some very well-established kind of you know neural pathways of why we make quick decisions. Uh, but on the other hand, when we're providing objective kind of sound public policy advice, that we really have to kind of check ourselves and our biases at, at the outset. 
So these are some of the key ones. Um, again, a, a lot of these have um, additional nuances to them, but confirmation bias, uh, seeking positive evidence to, to confirm beliefs. Um, that never happens in academia, of course. Uh, but in public policy, you know, it's it's just a trap, right? Again and again and again that 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 we see, particularly among statements that are already made <laughs> publicly, uh, and we have to come in and, and awkwardly present uh, some well-rounded evidence. The uh, ostrich effect, avoiding that which might uh, disagree with our beliefs, and that word is very important. Beliefs. Did you make a leap of faith, or did someone make a leap of faith uh, about a certain conclusion about a group, about an outcome, about a program? Uh, and, you know, we have to kind of challenge those things. Uh, halo effect, using experiences from a few, in this case, students uh, to generalize to, to all. Again, this is stereotyping. This is, you know, all those types of things that, uh, again, in a cognitive space, it's understandable. Uh, you know, in a public policy space, we really have to kind of disrupt and, and break, that, break that apart. Uh, privilege effect, uh, my reflection must be right, as you were not there. Uh, so this is where you know combination of different types of data can uh, come in and be very very helpful. Uh, IKEA effect it, it must have worked this way uh, as this is the way that that I did it. Uh, law of the instrument I think you've all heard this before. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and when we look at the different types of evidence that come our way, particularly in our case to help students, there might be multiple solutions uh, to help a problem. Our job is to illuminate the path. Uh, and finally, anecdotal fallacy, again, never happens. Uh, highlighting anecdotes that support our interpretations. Uh, this student, this, this student, this, this student, this. Now, the one asterisk I would put on that, and we'll we'll get into a, a little bit of this as, as time allows. Um, stories are good. Stories are good, but only in a way that are representative. Uh, and so we'll come across this all the time where anecdotes are used as representative. Uh, but in fact, they're not uh, kind of matching the overall conclusions of uh, of, of the data set. Uh, next, next slide, please. Yeah. Oops. Oops. There we go. There we go. So uh, maybe one or two more slides here, and then uh, you know, Jeremy, will turn it uh, turn it over to you. But um, th these are just a couple of quick things that um, to mention to this group uh, that that I admit. It probably took me a decade <laughs> to almost come up with. You just you learn this through osmosis over over time, you know, kind of briefing uh, elected officials. Um, and and I think you know Evelyn, you know, kind of fo emphasized this as well. Focus on the findings, de-emphasize the methods. When coming in as social scientists, experts, statisticians, there's almost you don't want to take advantage of it, but there's almost an embedded trust that your method is sound, that there's no surprises, that you're not going to uh, kind of trip trip anyone up at a, at a later date and be unrepresentative of, of what you're doing. Uh, so my advice to you is never to, um, uh, you know, undermine that trust um, and that when you're bringing something in to make sure it is representative, um, but get to the findings pretty quickly, uh, just in terms of time management and empathy with your with your audience. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, think of insights that link your findings to their mandate and priorities. And this, yeah, this might be uh, a quick transition to to Jeremy just just in a minute here. But um, the key message for me on this one is empathy. That you have whether it's elected officials that have a political mandate or deputy minister, or kind of ADMs. There's we all have pressures in our world of what we're trying to achieve. And if you really understand that, just the relationship link you can have with another human being and presenting information and that you're understanding what they're trying to achieve goes a long, long way. And so there's just there's a psychology to almost presenting the presenting the information. Um, and that takes a little bit of research. You got to invest in in kind of you know having that having that empathy but uh anyway just la last quick thing for me and you know happy to tag team the rest of it too jeremy but um you know i think this exercise super valuable uh again i i wish i had this you know quite, uh so, so, some years ago and, and we're always happy to to support but um 
you know, maybe Jeremy, you can maybe take it from here. I can. I can. Thank, Thank you very much. Very much. I've got in here, as Keith mentioned, I think he's really covered off example number one. Um, I think the, the example number two is something that's important when you're thinking of government and if you're even you know talking directors, executive directors, ADMs, um, deputies, is that there are some overriding contextual pieces that are super important, like a reconciliation or a gender-based analysis plus analysis uh, that is um, something that you need to bear in mind as a bigger picture because for um, making policy recommendations, some of the stuff you're going to get into um, is going to be things like the second bullet here, which is anticipating questions. Um, you're really going to be in a situation where they're going to know more than you do. They're going to have a contextual place that they're coming from, Whether and it doesn't matter where they are in government. They've got a view on things that um, is more strategic, and, um, and when it comes to some of the analysis that we do, we have to bear in mind what some of the strategic considerations are that there it's not just one narrow piece that you come in and fix uh, or have recommendations on the recommendations have a con fit in a context um, the main things that i wanted to bring out in some of these questions here um, after, after keith is that some of the some of the um the handy tips in in talking to government about research and about analysis and and is mentioned by Evelyn is super important. Visualizations are really important as that sort of shortcut to understanding. Um, and and it's so it's important to really put some effort into easily understood visualizations. Um, some of the visualizations that come from my team to me and to even Keith, they're not so easy to understand. They're technical. They're still in a they're still in a place of of trying to express a lot of ideas and a lot of information in in one space. Um, but by the time we take it farther, um, we need to have something that that people can understand quickly and that they can ask questions about. The second piece here, and just as I mentioned before, anticipating questions is super important in talking to people in government about policy. Um, when you're talking to, uh, before you get there, think about who you're going to see. Think about what you're sending them. Think about what kind of role they have. What do they care about? If you know, if it's possible to know, what kind of questions do they ask? Um, you know, it's been a really valuable tool for me in my career to, to understand where people are coming from so that they are able you if you have something you want to take to them and some, something you want to impart to them is to kind of meet them in a place where they'll be able to get going and so some of these questions particularly in government include things like how many people will this affect is it all everybody is it a subset of people where do they live um it that matters a lot um you know urban centers rural communities that piece on gba plus that i mentioned on the previous slide those are really important considerations in terms of talking about research and analysis. A couple of um, examples. We have in the last year um, done some work policy wise to support um, ministry priorities. Of course, one that's very timely is uh, the effects of COVID-19 COVID on learning. We were really early in this. We got on this very early. You know, we were directed by Keith and the deputy minister to really start looking at what's there. And what we were able to do here and what you can see on the slide is, you know, the sort of general findings that we had using our administrative data and to quote back to Keith on the, that very first slide, working with our partners and including our rights holders um, that what what was going on here? What can we tell the minister? What can we tell the deputy minister about what we see that's going on and and how can we have an impact going forward? And in this case, what we were able to see was that um, that we think the effects were going to be pervasive, that all students could be affected in some ways like we had to have an open mind to that. Um, a very big finding and was that the potential for increased disparity in underserved student populations so that those who were vulnerable before the pandemic were increasingly so during and especially those with intersections of at-risk factors. That we could see 
very early on and the work we're getting into now we're looking to see what actually happened there if anything um, and then of course the big finding that we found um, with a relatively new data collection was absenteeism that was the one thing policy wise that everybody came to us and said you need to examine absenteeism um, during the pandemic it could have um, it could have a, a very very long lasting effect on students in the, in their uh, in their educational journey the one thing we did do um, we were able to do because mental health is something that we felt very um, was worth looking into was that there was funding for priority programs um, like mental health for the beginning of the 21 22 uh, school year and that was specifically uh, mentioned in government announcements last summer one more uh, school meals so school meals is a mandate letter commitment for our minister in 2020 um, and we were tasked with providing some evidence so that guide the minister in how she meets that commitment so we did a full-on uh, literature review environmental scan we had a broad broad survey of schools we asked every school in the province um, what do you have what don't you have in terms of providing meals because the the province has a um, a bit of a, um, a, a hodgepodge of of meals programs and um, people who uh, provide them you know whether it's in school or you have community groups and that sort of thing and we really added socioeconomic status to that analysis we looked at the problem from multiple perspectives so the, and I mentioned this specifically because the minister has to think about a lot of things um, in terms of doing this so are we looking at a universal program targeted program local versus non-local nutritious versus whatever is available um, and we made high level suggestions based on the evidence and um, and from what we've seen in other places and because it's an ongoing project we don't actually have a policy decision but so this is really about um, you know what we did and how we then approached the minister um, to inform her so she can think about where to go and the policy folks in the ministry of um, will now develop um, this based on minister's direction so Keith is there anything you want to add to, to what I've said here just a just a very quick note on the the previous example on the on the COVID learning and to, oh, to illuminate an example of empathy because uh, and this is where you know the art comes into the the science a little bit uh, of when you're presenting this type of information uh, really thinking through how people are going to listen to you and conclude for example a, a Jerry Jeremy could come in uh, to the minister's office to be like Look, Minister, uh, everything is imploding. Uh, students are stressed. They've lost a year was worth of learning. They've, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then you do have, to be blunt, uh, FOI obligations. So that report could be kind of public and all this kind of stuff. So there's, there's things in that world uh, that I'm not going to lie to you. Politics do become a little bit intertwined into this into this space. So thinking about how that information's uh, presented. But fortunately, in this case, you know, Jeremy and I talk about how in the team how to present this information. The 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 absenteeism in data, for for example, actually turned into a very positive key message for government. And that British Columbia was one of certainly the only jurisdiction in Canada and even amongst the Western world to keep schools open during the entire pandemic. So it wasn't so much like a bragging point for her, but it was just an acknowledgement of uh, we did keep schools open. So it's actually understandable that there's going to be fewer impacts to kids because we made this policy decision. So on one hand, the data actually validated uh, a very powerful key message that you know government has has used, but also it illuminated. Well, here's a couple of things that we could do. Not only is the ministry, but then what could we direct to boards of education who are accountable for education delivery? So you can just see how the data story illuminated where our minister could go and she adopted that path but it was just going and again understanding you know from an empathetic point of view where where she's at 
Excellent. Now, the one thing is, but before we um, turn it back over to for questions and Perry, um, is there was a question about policy recommendations from Angel Poirier, I believe. I, um, so um, can you repeat that question? Because I don't know if Keith was on the line when you asked it. And it's a, I think it's one, Keith, that you will um, dig into right away. Yes. So Keith, before you got here, before you got here, Evelyn showed us that there's like three components to the flow of a presentation. The what, which is the data, the so what, which is going to be your analysis, and then the now what, which in our case for this competition will be a policy recommendation. So my question is, how do you know when you should just make the policy recommendation and shut up, or when you should take it further and say, oh yes, I know what you're thinking. There's problems with this particular policy recommendation and here's some other alternatives that are not as good and here's the reason why and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no, really good question uh, because I've seen this go sideways lots of times where like, you know, the, the advice is overextended. Uh, and, you know, to be blunt, a minister or an official has already made a decision. <laughs> Uh, you know, and is looking to deliberate on the data and how to kind of move move forward on on, on things. Uh, what's always worked, you know, kind of for for me is to uh, you know provide the findings, I guess, in in a very objective way. That um, and I've always said, and I even tried to set up verbally to a minister. I was like, listen, uh, best of, best advice is honest advice, <laughs> and so I'm going to lay out for you. These are the key things you have to know. There's also part of an art and a science of what is written down versus verbal. It gives people more psychological comfort of, you know, you can have a key line that, uh, you know, the outcomes of the program are X. However, let me tell you, Minister, in our case, in, in three school districts, it was awesome. In 57 districts, it was awful. Right, so you can kind of get at that. Uh, the other kind of tactic we've used, uh, again, I'm using our context, of course, but we have 60 school districts. There's a certain assumption around uh, a certain outcomes, say for a particular uh, cohort of, of kids, um, fill in the blank type of kind of sub subpopulation. And we'll show a chart that shows all 60 districts. And there's a variation. So without getting into Bayesian reasoning and probability theory and all that. You don't even have to get into that. People will intuitively get at that the variation and the bell curve among outcomes. And I would say almost 19 times out of 20, a decision maker will draw the conclusion that you want if you're kind of illuminating that that type of path through, through data. Um, you know, an example we have is on some kind of literacy and, and numeracy rates. There is the kind of this natural natural cutoff of a certain districts of those that achieve kind of over 80% and those that don't. Ah, let's go focus our efforts on these 10 districts. It's like, wow, that's what we just said to Jeremy. So, you know, people do get to that conclusion. It's just, you know, I don't know if that's that's connecting with your with your question or not, but if it would have been of a psychological speed bump if I came in and said, Minister, you focus on those 10 versus showing the chart that gets to them in a more in a more natural way and then they own it and so i'm you know kind of belaboring that point of the 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 neural element of briefing information is not just the chart it's how you're presenting it with empathy and let people draw their own conclusion of where you want kind of want them to go uh, i know it sounds a little machiavellian not meant to be um but you know that's where we've had a lot of success and then they own it they want to do it and you know rather than us kind of coming in and overextending if that if that makes sense yeah it, it's a lot to absorb and it doesn't directly answer my question because you answered with well here's all the different ways that we extrapolate on the policy recommendations and so i'm going to go away and think about this um and think about whether i think there's ever at a time that it is appropriate to make a policy recommendation and shut up, which like I I, I don't think there is. Yeah, well, here's 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 an example and, it, and it's um, uh, I know it's not satisfactory to say it depends, but it kind of does depend. Uh, yeah. For example, uh, you know, Jeremy's team has been assigned evaluations. 
evaluations of a program. And you know, for example, we have uh, a program called uh, kind of Strong Start, where it's not in every school district, but there's kids that come in at kind of three, four, five years old uh, prior to kindergarten entry and experience the school environment and you know do play based learning and things like that. Uh, we can evaluate that program. Did it work? How is it working? Is it working in different kind of context? In that entirely full license to provide recommendations, right? This is what's working. This is what's not. We can shift this because we're trying we're trying to help kids. Um, I think that the tricky territory that analysts run into is understanding the political landscape of. You know, are people are you leaning towards a certain thing? Uh, are they really open minded to to where they want to go? Um, but in an evaluative context, I would say for sure you're on safe ground for for policy recommendations. Hi, hi, I have I have a question. Thank you. Um, thanks to the presenters and and um, I'm wondering you all made reference to the importance of of you know with empathy and and um, policy levers. And I've heard reference to policy levers not only in this presentation, but in another a number of other presentations. And I'm wondering if you have any guidance for um, an efficient and effective way to become aware of the relevant policy levers um, in, a, in a particular area of policy um, recommendations or, or, or analysis. I'm I'm happy to start. I'm sure colleagues will want to want to chime in because um, that we have specifically invested in in that space. Uh, and so where the empathy piece comes in is presenting information to a decision maker of which they don't have much control over to influence. Is was the problem we were trying to were tr problem we're trying to solve. Um, so in the Ministry of Education context. Well, what levers do we does a minister or de deputy minister actually have? Well, we got legislation, we have curriculum, we have assessment, we have information systems, kind of labor relations. I don't know whether you conclude you have control over that. Um, and uh, and funding. So when you that's the toolbox that they have, and they know that. So they're listening to you with okay, problem A, problem B, problem C, and then to the to kind of the previous kind of question. It's like, well, I recommend you go here, here, and here. Well, I actually only have levers to address the first one or two items. In a, in a student, ex, you know, kind of example, we have um, about kind of two thirds of variation among student outcomes are outside of the classroom, and about one third of student outcome variation is inside of the classroom. So we use non-statistical terms to explain this to a minister that within an education system context, this is what we have some control and influence over. And if you wanted to consider, uh, you know, stepping into this space, here's some things we could do. We could change a regulation here. We could adjust a funding policy here. We could change a curriculum uh, component there. It's like, oh, okay, well then go do that, <laughs> right? Whereas a lot of the conversations go. so. You know, it's it's definitely worth investing in talking to uh, kind of the policy departments and areas. Uh, you know, kind of colleagues within whatever respective uh, government department is, and uh, more often than not, they'll be happy to to share with you what what the levers are. Thank you. 